Good afternoon, everyone. This is Krista King-Oaks, Youth Services Consultant with the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives. Today, you are in the webinar titled Stronger Together, Developing Schools and Library Partnerships, presented by Youth Services Librarian Bookie Wilson with the Woodford County Public Library in Versailles. Thank you to the Institute for Museum and Library Services for the support behind today's webinar. Just a reminder that I will be monitoring the chat box. If you have any questions for our presenter, please put them in the chat and we will get to them at the end of the recording. If you have any technical issues, especially with the audio, please make sure to check the audio wizard setup and the meeting toolbar at the top of the screen or let us know in the chat box and we will do our best to troubleshoot. A reminder that the slides of today's webinar will be made available at the end of the training. And the webinar is being recorded and will be available within one week. With that, I would like to turn it over to Bookie Wilson. Take it away. Thank you. I'm so glad to see so many people um, online with us today. I hope you all haven't frozen in your various locations. Um, so we'll, get jump, we'll just jump right into this. I have been at the Woodford County Library for 10 years, and we had a great summer reading program. We had a great relationship with our school system, and everything was picking along really well. I went to, was lucky enough to get to go to the Public Library Association meeting in 2014. And by the way, I think it's going to be in Nashville next year. And if you get a chance to go, it is totally, totally worth the time and money. Their theme was Dream Big, and so we left that several days of a conference in, oh, let's see, it was in Indianapolis, with wonderful ideas, great big ideas. David Sedaris spoke, Brian Stevenson spoke, Amy Cuddy spoke, she did her TED Talks. Um, it was amazing. But one, the best thing that I came away with from that was I went to a breakout session that was hosted by a principal and several librarians from outside Chicago. And the teaser was that this school, it's called Highland Elementary, which is on 90% free lunch, had seen a 97% increase in their summer reading rates, their summer reading completion rates. Well, you better believe that drew me in because I wanted to find out what they were doing. So I went to this workshop, left with pages of notes and an, an agreement that I could call and speak to Principal Johnson anytime, which I have done more than once, to get his ideas. And so I came back with his ideas and we implemented a lot of them. So, you know, we have summer reading every year, just I'm sure like you all do in June and July. And we had always done it and the the schools were great to work with us. We'd go visit the classrooms. We'd hand out information. But this, after this big conference, it was a couple years, it took about a year and a half to make it all come together. I met with the superintendent of public schools here, Scott Hawkins, and shared with him our ideas and what we had learned and told him we wanted to dream big. And he said, well, count us in, but how big do you mean? And I said, we mean pretty darn big. So we were able to start working together in a very intentional manner and going to faculty meetings and just having a, a much stronger relationship than we would had in the past. It was always good, but now it was like we are really going to partner together. So we wanted to get community support and involvement, and we thought the best way to start with that was through the schools. So we were able to go to the faculty, each faculty meeting of the schools here in Woodford County and share with the teachers what we had planned going on. This was going to be the first year that we tracked completion rate. We had always kept a tally of how many kiddos signed up, but we wanted to follow through and see how they were completing. So we went to the schools and we shared the information about that, and the teachers were really, really, and really involved. Um, the superintendent said he was with us uh, any way he could help, and he was a great advocate and a terrific support. Um, and part of our community-wide programming, it was my dream to get. So 
something about the summer reading program at the library on every marquee in Versailles. I got to tell you that it's easier said than done. Because I talk to the people at Long John Silver's and they say, oh yeah, we'll put it up tomorrow. And then, you know, life happened and it didn't get done. But we did get, we did get information about the summer reading program on a lot of marquees throughout town. So we wanted to just just plaster the city with information about summer reading. So here's our Superintendent Hawkins. And this is a direct idea that we borrowed from the school system in Chicago, outside Chicago. Um, I believe it's in Elgin, Illinois. And one of the things they did was they called it their Superintendent's Reading Challenge. Well, we decided to tweak that a little bit. And, but one of the things they did was they suggested to get a cutout of your superintendent and have it as a photo op, it's something you could use on social media. And I'll tell you, this was well worth the money. I can't remember where we got this. You can order these online. We may have even been able to buy it around here. It cost a couple hundred dollars because we thought the next year we would do each of the principles. But when you start looking at the multiplier effect of four elementary schools and the middle school and the high school, times 200, I don't know, $36, that turned into a lot of money. So we just stuck with the, with the superintendent. And we have a great graphic designer. She photographed him and then she photoshopped in the reading, uh, the cute little reading logo on there for him. And this lived here in the library. Sorry, this picture's kind of blurry. Um, but this lived here in the library for a long time, we'd take it to Midway to our branch library. We decorated it throughout the summer. And then we passed it on to the superintendent afterwards. And I have heard from a number of folks that, are, that work out at the, the school board or in the school system that they have a good time with this now, that they've been known to put hearts on. For Valentine's Day, I, they put a crown on. I think they put sunglasses. They probably have a big woolly scarf wrapped around his neck today. But this was a fun thing, and it was a great way to build a lot of buzz throughout the community. So we have a lot of programs throughout the summer in the library. But we have one community room that holds really about 85 people comfortably. So you know that means we squeeze in a few more, and it's super snug. So in connecting with the school system, we asked the, with, we asked the superintendent if we could contact the teachers, I'm sorry, contact the principals to see if we could have assemblies at the school. And we did. That was very successful. Um, we invited the teachers to come. So if you were at a Hunter Town school assembly on a Thursday afternoon in June, we would recognize the kids that went to Hunter Town school that were part of the summer reading program. We would recognize the teachers there, and they encouraged the kids to keep reading. It was a big rah-rah session. We had a great pep rally, but then we had a super assembly afterwards. We had animal shows and musicians and magic shows, you know, all the things that you do for summer reading. We dovetailed these programs with camps that were within the schools, and that was really, really successful because we'd have several schools that had reading camps, and if you have 60 kids already there on a Thursday afternoon for a reading camp and they can slip on into the program, it's all the better for everybody and they have a great time and a nice change of scenery. We also signed up kiddos for summer reading at the school and we gave away prizes that first year. Here's the superintendent and our handing out uh, drawing for prizes. We were able to get a lot of our local restaurants, probably pretty much everybody gave us prizes for summer reading. McDonald's gave us great coupons and gift certificates. We got things from, we got pizzas and Starbucks and it was just fun to have that random uh, intermittent reinforcement of you come to a program, all you had to do was be present to win. So that was a lot of fun. We did not, however, do that the next year because our McDonald's was purchased um, and they have changed their giving policy. So it's made it a lot tougher to get coupons, but that was pretty exciting. We also had books that were that we were able to give away. You all get donations just like we do. 
and we would save the really nice books or get a few special ones when Scholastic was having a sale and we'd give those away too. So we made these programs fun and exciting and I think our average attendance was in the hundred, now average, so you know of course some were super high, um, but we averaged about 170. One of the things that we did um, that's been great to do with the schools and just in general was um, we have set up a traveling book collection and we borrowed this idea from gosh Boyle County I think I'm going to take a swig here just a second I'm getting a little dry thank you um, I believe it was Boyle County that your bookmobile goes out you get people excited about summer reading they come onto the bookmobile specifically you know if they're coming into the library typically they're in good shape to check out but if you're going out within your county and you've gotten these kids psyched the bookmobiles here at this program at this school and then little Janie gets on and we look and she has an $85 fine from where her books weren't returned it's such a demoralizing experience so Boyle County utilizes uh, they did utilize it I'm not sure that they do still they're a traveling book collection so you can see these book tubs over here next to one of the teachers and we gathered a truckload of books from lots of different places we took things that had been donated we have we always have a big book sale going on you all probably do too and we get first crack at the donations for um, that would be appropriate for kiddos and actually some of them are good enough to put in the collection which is super nice others we give away and then others we put into the traveling books um, I was also able to get a bunch of books from Scott County they were weeding rather heavily that year in their nonfiction and they were generous they generously shared those with us so all we did for those was put, we generated a little label sorry I'm going to go back here um, on the side of the book that you can see it right there that says um, this is a traveling book return it to the Woodford County Library and pick out another or something to that effect so it's not cataloged at all it doesn't have a barcode from the library so if they don't come back it's okay you know our goal much like your all is to get books in the hands of kiddos and if a book ends up staying at home with somebody hopefully they read it over and over and maybe they share it with a friend so our goal is really being reached is with that of putting a book in kids hands so we took lots of different tubs to each of these events and we have a very sophisticated bookkeeping system it's a notebook and we would write down Krista three we didn't write the titles we didn't write anything else about it and we say to Krista when you come back next week to the next program bring these back and you can take three more home if they didn't come back we didn't make a big fuss about it and frankly we have books returned to us all year long now through the traveling books I came in last week and I had a bunch of books on my desk that somebody had returned we also have had good success using these traveling books with different agencies and groups that we work with in our community we um, have great outreach with several programs here in town I'll talk more about those in a minute and um, we use them for that too and we keep tubs of them on the bookmobile just for those kiddos that have the $68 fine and can't check out so the first year what we did was we had a big assembly when school returned at each we had an assembly at each of the schools to recognize the kids who had completed summer reading with these cute stickers picked out uh, printed they were not expensive I think it said I'm a, a hero reader I forget something like that but you know everybody likes a sticker and we gave each of the schools an ice cream social or one school elected to have donuts since we were meeting with them at 8 o'clock in the morning then the school that had the largest number of students that completed and that was the key thing this was the first year we were tracking completion received a trophy and an all-school assembly with a performer an animal show a magic show or something like that we've had animal shows the last few years and they have been a huge hit we um, had the VIPs were the kiddos who had completed we had them sit in front 
And then at the end, we read out the names and we had everybody sign up. Um, the trophy was a big deal. And this came directly from the folks in Elgin, Illinois. They said, you got to have a trophy. And we were concerned about highlighting differences between our schools in terms of economics. And he said, uh, Steve Johnson, my best buddy there, said that the thing that happens is, and we have seen this, is you generate a lot of competition with your principals. And that's exciting because they are revving up their kids and saying, hey, we're not going to let Southside beat us this year. So they gen that generates a lot of buzz and excitement on that end. And it's not about who has the most kids on free lunch or who has the biggest PTA. So the trophy goes and lives with the school that wins it each year. So here's the key to this part. <clears throat> so we have four elementary schools. Of course, they're different sizes and they are varied. So if you have 300 kids sign up from Southside and 115 sign up from Simmons, obviously you've got a great disparity there. So what we did, based around the Elgin, Illinois information, was you take the school with the highest percentage of completers. So if Southside had 300 sign up, but they only had 40 completers, and Simmons had 115 sign up, and they had 80 completers, obviously you can see that your percentage is very different and very significant. So that levels the playing field, and we have found that to be successful. So here are the kiddos from one of the schools that um, got to have ice cream with us one year. We ended up changing that. What we found out was happening was we're people, and we're putting names into the record, and we missed kids. And so you'd go to an assembly, and somebody would be crying because they'd say, Miss Bookie, I turned my log in, and it, it you know, it, that was generating negativity that we didn't want to have. So what we do now is we try to go, we, we don't have a specific assembly, but we go and we rev everybody up before school ends. We usually visit each of the classrooms. And then we have one big assembly when school starts back for the school that won the trophy. Last year it was Northside. And we went over, we presented the trophy in front of the school. We didn't call out the children's names. We just said everybody that completed, I'm sorry, everyone that participated in summer reading, please stand. We gave them a big cheer. And then we presented the trophy to the principal. Then they get to keep it and have the, bag, the bragging rights for a year. So let's talk a little bit, um, oh, sorry, let me go back here a little bit. So that first year, was the first year we were collecting completion data. Remember, we hadn't done that before. We saw a 13% increase in signups with 17% completed. The second year, we saw a 4% increase in signups with a 24% completion rate. Of course, we were pretty thrilled about that. The next year, we saw a decrease, 9% in signups, and I'll explain why. But we had 31% complete. So if our goal is to make sure the kids are reading, we're happy with the completion numbers. We, of course, like you all, always want to have more children signing up for summer reading. But we dis discovered, we attribute this decrease to one big factor. That was how we handled the sign-ups for summer reading. So every year we would go to the schools and we would print a little flyer it said, come to the summer reading kickoff party. It's Friday, May the 21st. Sign up for summer reading. Programming starts June 1st. It's free and fun. Very simple, not a lot of verbiage. So this, the year that we saw the drop off, we decided, well, what if we print the summer reading logs for all the schools? Then on one side, it has the basic info about it. And the next side, it has the reading log. So you're pretty much automatically enrolled. Now, we didn't have the children's names to input them into a database. But let's say Krista gets her sheet. All she has to do is read, fill out the reading log, and return it to the library. Then she gets her summer reading bag and all the goodies and stuff like that. We learned that that was not very successful. Um, we learned it didn't work. It wasn't successful for us. 
And um, we, in our regional conference, which covers us, Jessamine County, Clark, Franklin, um, Boyle, I forget who else, um, Fayette, that other libraries that had done this found exactly the same thing. They saw a drop off in the number of kiddos they had signed up for summer reading. So we learned, and we didn't do it last year, nor will we do it again. <clears throat> but we have seen our numbers continue to rise in the completion factor, and we love that. So I was telling you that we do a lot of programming now within the community with the support of the school system and just the community in general. So one of the things we do each summer is partner with Community Outreach. This is a group called Esperanza. They are with um, their kiddos that go to one of our local elementary schools, Simmons, and they meet at a church across the street every Tuesday from like 2.30 to 5. And there, there are lots of tutors and there's enrichment programming and they feed the kiddos a snack and they have fun and play. But last summer the kiddos came over well, they have a bus, and they were able to bring the kids over, and we had a program with the Avanza students once a week. So um, here's Miss Robin in the polka dot dress. She is the Avanza coordinator. Miss Becky, you all may know her, who's worked here. Becky's worked here for 20 years. And Elba, who's joined us full time a couple years ago, who is a native Spanish speaker. So this was successful and lots of fun. One thing we did learn from this was um, that the kids liked it. We, we had Miss Robin call each week, and that really helped. So we also do a program with a group called Avanza. That was Esperanza. Avanza has been in business. They started their community outreach about eight years ago. That's done through a church here in town, and they focus on students at Huntertown School. Same students, Hispanic speakers primarily. Esperanza does have a few students that are that are not English speakers, but I believe they have a Russian, a student who speaks Russian as a native tongue and Chinese or Japanese. So they're, they have cast their net, net a little bit wider. But in working with the schools and the community outreach, here we are with Avanza, Esperanza, we work with a group called LIFT, Leaders Inspired for Tomorrow, that works with students from kind of wherever in, the, in our community once a week. Becky works with Esperanza. I work with Avanza. Megan, our teen services um, librarian, works with LIFT. And she also works with Mentors and Meals, which is a program that takes high school students, successful high school students, and pairs them with middle schoolers they meet four days a week at a nearby church, and then they feed them dinner every night. So that's students that need a little TLC and a little boost. So we're doing that in lots of different ways. So last summer, we embarked upon a summer feeding program. Have any of you all done that? I'd love to give me a shout out if you all are part of the summer feeding program. We were approached about it um, a few years ago. One of the things that we decided to do in increasing our outreach was <clears throat> partner with the school system on, on the summer feeding program, but just one day a week. If you haven't done it, it's, oh good, Susan, I see you all in Crittenden County do lunches. Um, feel free to put, add some more input, add some information about how that's worked for you if you'd like. Um, so we decided to just do Thursdays, and we did every Thursday in June and July throughout summer, just throughout summer reading, and we met either in the library, when, oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm conflating my info here. It's kind of hard to keep it straight sometimes, you all know. So each Thursday we met at a, some place in the community. So the first Thursday and every alternating Thursday after that, we met at the housing uh, authority. We have a great relationship with the woman who runs the housing authority and she was terrific to work with. So we would go out there each Thursday. We provided lunches to, to children who are under 18. They are free. Um, Chantel, who runs the housing authority, has monies that she can designate 
for programming and she took some of that money and used it so the adults that wanted to come to the program could also eat, eat free. Otherwise, the meals are $3. So we went out and we did story time and a craft that was every other Thursday at the Housing Authority. And then those other four Thursdays, we picked parks throughout Woodford County and we tried to get ones that were spread a little bit out, spread out a bit geographically. So people that lived a little farther out that didn't have um, transportation could just walk to one of the other locations. So we had, we went to one church and then we just went to other parks. But last summer, after having seen how amazingly well the summer feeding program worked, we decided to embark upon it here at our library. <clears throat> so we started last June. We fed meals every weekday from tw noon to one. We typically had, gosh, 80 to 100 people come eat. On Wednesdays, we had pizza, so that was a big deal. We always had a big crowd for that. And it actually went really, really smoothly. If you are on the fence about doing it or giving some thought, or you haven't ever thought about it, I would really encourage you to give it a try. This is our director here in the blue shirt handing out pizza. She was the one who wanted, to, who thought this was something we could do, and Becky and I were super excited about it because we weren't sure about the logistics, and she took it as her project and oversaw it, which was amazing. It was exciting and fun for her because she got to see people every single day at lunch and it um, cemented a lot of relationships with families that she might not have known as well as Becky and I did and just other folks in the community. It, it was great. Karen did an amazing job with that. And then we had a part-time worker who helped every single day. You really need two people for it. And um, then we would we'd feed everybody lunch they go into the community room and hang out, and the lunches were really good. We had pizza on pizza on Tuesdays or Wednesdays. I forgot. I think it was Wednesday. You think I'd remember that? And it's special pizza. They do it with Little Caesars, and it has a different um, makeup. They put whole wheat or whole grain into the crust, and they use extra cheese so it meets the nutritional requirements. Plus, also, they work with uh, our orchard here in town and farmers, so they're utilizing local crops. We had great strawberries. The salads were amazing. Um, fresh broccoli. I can't even remember what else came from our farmers, but the food was good. And um, they got milk, and they had chocolate milk and white milk. If you came and there were leftovers and you were under 18, you could have seconds for free. Some days we didn't have seconds and we had to give them a buzz and some days we ran out and we would call uh, Courtney who oversaw the program and within 10 minutes we had more meals here at the library. It was easy, quick, it went super, super well and I think we fed 2,800, nearly 2,800 folks last summer. So I'd say think about it, give it a try. Um, I've left my email address on the last slide so you can take a look at that. If you have questions, don't hesitate to contact me, but I would really encourage you to give it a go. Um, we also do lots of other programs with the schools, and you know, it always helps if you feed people. Um, so circling back to continuing, uh, how we continue to strengthen our relationship with the school, we've done lots of different programs. Uh, one was called Ready, Set, Kindergarten. That was a school preparedness. You know, 50% of our kiddos in Kentucky are not ready to go to kindergarten. So we have tackled that. We have a great relationship with our early childhood council, and they have they are overseeing and have overseen and generated programs for us in the past that have been terrific. So um, Ready Set Kindergarten is ages three to five. We've had brain builders ages zero to three. We've seen the numbers steadily increase with that. With Ready, Set, Kindergarten, we saw good numbers from the beginning and those numbers have continued. We do that, um, some we do in the fall now for the next year, and then we're gonna have some programs here 
in the spring that will continue this. So we fed the families for each one of these, and you can't go wrong if you bring Waffle House. I'm just saying. I don't know if you all have ever done it, if you have a Waffle House in your community, but when you feed people, when you get those waffles cranked up, they you can't see all their waffle makers they had back there in the back, but they made waffles to order. They brought scrambled eggs and bacon and sausage, and when you walk in the library, you smell those waffles cooking, it generates a lot of buzz. So here's everybody having dinner. And then we broke up into different groups. This is one of those sunny days where it was, you know, like 100 degrees outside in, I don't know, March. Uh, we had the preschool teachers, several preschool teachers from the community were hired to do the training. They did an awesome job. That was fun, too, because the kids got to meet who their preschool teachers might be. It was all very fun driven. And we went from station to station and everybody had a great time. So Ms. Becky reading the story to our kiddos. Um, so we've also, okay, so Ready Set Kindergarten, Brain Builders. And then last year, we decided to change our programming a little bit. In the past, we had done Ready Set Kindergarten and we did it by, in Spanish and English. But that gets kind of clunky, we found. When you are reading a book and then I read a line in English and Elba reads a line in Spanish. So we decided to do a separate program that is totally in Spanish and it's called Niños Listos, Children Read, or Children Ready, sorry. And that's for preschoolers. It's not limited so much at, at the ages of the other ones. And we work with the Early Childhood Council. We work, work with our Family Resource Centers. We have several native Spanish speakers that work either with Family Resource Center or Elba here in the library. She was a part of it. And they provided lunch. They changed it, and it worked really well, too, from having it in the evening. The other programs were in the evening, I think, Tuesday night at 5.30 or 6. This was on a Friday, and they're going to do that again. 11.30 to 1, they provided lunch. Um, I believe they were able to provide some transportation, and they typically had about 16 or 20 moms, typically it was moms, and children come to that that were native Spanish speakers. They left with great goodies, too. They gave them manipulatives, of course, everything age-appropriate, developmentally appropriate, like Play-Doh. They gave them books. They gave them, um, I think, bean bags and all sorts of great stuff. So that was a big, big success. But we have a really strong relationship with our family resource center centers here at the schools. So let's see. Oh, I forgot to talk about thematic kits. So um, one of the things, another thing we've done that has improved our relationship, or not improved because it was good already, but strengthened our relationship with the schools. Of course, I got permission from the superintendent to do this. Was we would we would visit each of the schools and we visit the faculty about once a year. We share with them all the things that we do that help them, and what's available at the library to make their jobs easier. Um, one of the things we started doing, and I believe we borrowed this idea from Franklin County, where we set up thematic kits. These are those big hefty tubs. I think we bought these from Kroger. And we have about a dozen of these now. And they're just themes that interest. It's typically kindergarten, first grade, and kindergarten and below. Um, we just added a dinosaur's kit. So of course, we'll never be able to photograph that because it will always be checked out. But we have these kits, and they check out constantly. So you can see on the top, we have a little we print out a list of all of the books. We put 10 books in the tub, and then we put manipulatives. Might be a puzzle. For the time one, it's a little clock. You can adjust the clock face. For All About Me, it has a little plastic stethoscope. Um, I Like Me has a little mirror and other things. Um, I forget what all's in, in each one. In the alphabet, it has the alphabet A, B, C's. Um, bean bags that the kids think are, think are a ton of fun. Uh, the farm 
has different farm animals. So you just check, you check it all out. It has one barcode. When you check it out, you count and make sure everything's in there. Show your families what they're getting, and then when you count when it comes back. It really, knock on wood, hasn't been a huge problem in terms of loss. I think we've lost one of the bean bags, but most everything comes back pretty faithfully. I had a little crawdad, a plastic green crawdad on my desk the other day, and I know where in the world that had come from. And this little guy that's always here came up and he said, oh, Miss Bookie, that's our crawdad. It needs to go in the oceans kit or the water kit or something. He said, we checked that out and we forgot to get that back in there. So I was glad to know what that belonged to. So for teachers, we offer these, and now we offer them to anybody. Anybody can check out these thematic kits. And we are continuing to add to the collection. We ask the teachers what they would like, and we've tried to come up with a lot of science-driven ones for kindergarten and first grade, because with STEM being so important as part of the core curriculum, these uh, teachers are finding these a nice addition to their classroom. We also use these tubs for many things, but we have the picture book of the month club, and this has been a huge hit. So what we do is we create these tubs each month. So I'll go visit the teachers at Huntertown School. On the first Thursday of each month, when I read to the kiddos in Miss Cheney's class, I take, a, there are four teachers that get the picture books of the month at Huntertown, and I take care of those. So what I do is, so school starts, and I go, and I have four tubs, and I've gone through in August, and I've pulled fun picture books. Now, these are for kindergarten and preschool, so they're age appropriate. I always put an alphabet book in there, a math book, and we've just started, well, not started, we've had these great blast-off readers from Scholastic that are leveled one, two, and three. They're terrific nonfiction books. And I typically pull several of those. We have a nice collection of the animal ones. So I might put baby elephants in one, um, tractors in the same one, uh, iguanas in the same one. I usually put three of those little blast-off readers in those. And those are lots of fun. So then I deliver these to the classroom. I check them out to the teacher. They get 20 books. So I'll take them that first Thursday. And then the first Thursday of the next month, when I go visit the, the pre-K classroom in the morning, I'll pick up all the tubs, bring them back to the library, and when I go back to read to the classroom again in the afternoon, I take, them the new, I take a new one to each classroom. Now, occasionally the teachers will text, um, send me an email and ask for, they may have had um, some difficulty in the class and they need a book about loss of a pet, or divorce, or death, you know, those sorts of hard issues that they might not have a lot of books for. So I'll slip in some of those. I always try to do ones that are timely in terms of holidays and seasons, too. But these have been a big hit. And if you take five of these tubs out to schools, just five, that's 100 books more a month that you're circulating. So it can have a really big impact on your SERP numbers. Also, I forgot to mention the traveling books. When you write down, when I wrote down, Krista checked out three books. We don't worry about checking them back in, but those numbers count for CERT too. So you just be sure and file that away. So with our picture books of the month, I'll flip back here real quick to our tubs again. Another thing that we do with our teachers is when we go to faculty meetings, we tell them we've got picture books. Picture Book of the Month Club, we've got the book kits. We also have a teacher card, and that's been great to strengthen our relationship with our teachers. So a teacher card means you just have, you open your card in the regular way, but you as a teacher have some special treats, like you don't incur any fines, and you, if a book is lost or damaged, we don't charge you for it. That's just the cost of doing business, and we don't want to penalize a teacher because a child takes a book home and it doesn't come back. Maybe we've lost or had to 
uh, take three off people's accounts in the last several years. So it's really not an issue. The teachers are really vigilant about it, and they, they're um, teaching their children that these are where the books go for this, and this bookie's coming, and it's been a, it, it's been a really nice way to supplement their classroom library, and it helps their budget. We also work with the teachers on teacher-driven driven units, like author studies, illustrator studies. And a teacher came to me about two years ago and said, I'm so tired of all the illustrators I've done. Could you find a new illustrator, or new to me, and bring me a bunch of books for our illustrator study? And so we've introduced teachers to Kadir Nelson that didn't know him, who he's one of my favorite illustrators. You know, most everybody knows Jan Brett. Most everybody knows Jerry Pinckney and Patricia Polacco. But it's exciting to find some new illustrators um, and share those books with the teachers. Then we can also do thematic studies. So if you're doing, I took a whole bunch of books on the landforms and stuff a few weeks ago to teachers. I took books on economic economics and um, Let's see, gosh, the Declaration of Independence, and I forget all what else. Um, we also can pull, like, uh, for one of the teachers, she just wanted chapter books to augment what she had in her classroom. So we were, we were able to do that, too. But it's everybody wins. It is great for the teachers, and it's great for us. And we also pick up and deliver, and that's wonderful for the teachers, too. So oftentimes what they'll do is they'll just shoot us an email that says, Bookie, I'm doing, um, I am studying erosion and earth signs. Can you bring some books by? And I'll pick them out and check them out on her card and deliver them. And everybody loves it, and we are happy to help. Um, and, you know, we know our collection so well that it takes us not a long time to go through and pull the books, and we just tell the teachers, Please let us help you. If you'd like, we're happy to go through and select books for you. If you prefer and you want to spend the time on the catalog, you're welcome to put the books on hold yourself. And some teachers like to do that. And we'll come in and pull a big stack of books for Ms. Hudson and deliver them to her then. It's just they're the ones that she has picked out. But we're happy to work with them in either way. Um, let's see. We um, haven't partnered as much with the middle school and the high school as we have with the elementary, just because of the nature of the students. But um, our new teen librarian, Megan, um, is really working to forge stronger relationships there. Um, high school, you know, is a different sort of animal, but we've had a, some really neat opportunities with the high school this year. The latest thing that we just did was we partnered with the librarian and the medical science science class. They read a book by an English surgeon, Henry Marsh, called First, Do No Harm. And then we purchased the movie. Uh, there was a documentary about him called um, The English Surgeon and watched about an hour's worth of it here at the library. And then I am friends with a couple, married couple. The wife is a psychiatrist, and the husband is a neurosurgeon. And I asked if they could come speak to the, speak to the students, and they did. So the first, I think it was the 8th of January, we watched the movie. The next Tuesday, the 15th, the, the psychiatrist came and talked to the students. And the next Tuesday, the 22nd, the neurosurgeon came and talked to the students. It was really very interesting because they brought such different perspectives. You know, here's how I deal, here's, here's the brain and the brain science of a, as a, that I deal with as a psychiatrist, and here's what I do as a surgeon. But uh, the attendees were overwhelmingly young women. I think we had one man for one program, and it was interesting for them to speak with the psychiatrist and talk to her about how do you balance your life as a physician, as a mom, as somebody who travels a lot, as somebody whose three kids are very, very active. And she was really frank about things. And I think it was a very beneficial night for everybody. So that was lots of fun. 
So I think I'm about to end the things. Here's just a few pictures of our summer reading calendars. And you know, it's going to be space here before long. Um, it looks like we have about 15 minutes left. Um, so Krista, if you have some questions or anybody has some questions, they can shoot those our way. I'd be glad to address them. Um, here's my email address. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to you on the phone, but if you all are like me, my schedule is so topsy-turvy. I am in and out so much, it's sometimes hard to catch each other. But um, if you do have any questions or comments or stuff you want to chat about, uh, please shoot me an email, and then I'll be happy to give you a call sometime. So I think that kind of winds things up on my end. Thank you so much, Bookie, so much wonderful information that really covers um, so many different parts of the year. Do you have anything exciting coming up uh, for summer reading this year or any twists that you're putting on any of your partnerships? Well, we are continuing to do our um, programs with the Ready Set Kindergarten and the Early Childhood Council. That's been a great team to work with. Megan, uh, the teen librarian, um, is working more closely with the middle school. She visits the school out there, I think, about twice a month and takes books, uh, books that have we been weeded or arcs that we've been given and gives away books, takes promotional materials and hands things out. And we have seen since Megan started mm, mid-October or the first November, we have seen our SARC numbers jump up because she's putting books in kids' hands. She also has a great manga and anime group. And when you get when those kiddos come in, they, they'll check out 20 copies of a series. So those numbers have really jumped up. Um, we're going to change our summer reading a little bit. You know, you live and learn and change things around. We are going to do the summer feeding program again, probably about the same time. Um, that worked really well to have it for an hour. I think most places do it for half an hour, but we didn't think we could have the onslaught of 100 people within about a 20-minute period, so having it for an hour has been very successful for us. Last year, we planned programming to be before and after the meals. That made for some days that were pretty crazy busy. So we will continue to do that, but we'll push the we'll change the timing on the program. Like on a typical Tuesday, we would have an, a 10 o'clock story time, no, a 9.30 story time for toddlers, an 11 o'clock story time for preschoolers, lunch at 12, and then a program for seven, to, seven and eight year olds at one o'clock, and then a teen program at four. So Tuesdays were pretty much um, like a marathon. So we're going to change that around a little bit this year and spread out the programming a little bit more because we discovered it wasn't as dependent. The success of the meals and the success of the programs were not as dependent upon each other as we anticipated. So people would come to the program and stay to eat, or people would stay to eat and stay for the program. It wasn't like they were so closely linked that as we thought that they would be. We thought people might not come eat unless they had something to do afterwards, and that wasn't always the case. Um, one thing that we did last year that I want to share with you all, just which was fun, was we had a cow visit the library. Her name was Jet, and she was through the South, I think it's called the Southeast Dairy Cooperative. Um, you can find them online, and the woman who Took, who brought Jet to visit us was from Glasgow. Because when you go online and look, the cows are from, they're based out of Texas. And I was thinking, gee whiz, they surely are not going to bring a cow all the way from Texas to us. But they brought a cow from Glasgow. She came in her own special trailer. She was here from about 10.30 in the morning till about 1.15. So we built all our programming around that, and that was really terrific because they milked her about every half an hour when we would go outside for a program, and it was a glass milking container. So you could, and of course they had a milking machine, and the woman talked about how all that worked. But you could see the milk go into this glass container, and when you go back, 
a half an hour later, she was a cute little brown Jersey cow, you would see that big, heavy, thick layer of cream on the top. So there were lots of great opportunities to talk about a lot of things. But you know, my grandmother had a dairy, um, and I know in Bowling Green, Denise, you all have a, a lot of great dairies in your neck of the woods. Um, a lot of kids don't know that how milk comes from cows, so it was pretty cool. So that's one of the fun things we're doing this summer. We'll continue to have programming um, at our school that's been really successful. And one of the things we do every year is have a touch a truck event. I don't know if you all do that, but I would strongly encourage you to do it. They are free. We have it at our Midway Branch Library, which is next door to Northside School. They have a nice big circular drive there. And we just contacted everybody we knew that had a truck. KU, the Ruggles Sign Company here in town, um, the, the roads folks here, um, the fire department came. UK has a special neonatal ambulance if you live in our neck of the woods. They will come, of course, if they have an emergency, they have to leave. So they did get to come one year and they handed out cute little blue sunglasses to all the kiddos. Um, maybe we had all tech. Oh, we had a horse. Uh, we had Sally Horse Fan Company here. They came and brought a horse fan. That was super cool. So typically, we have 250 or so people come to our Touch a Truck event. We do it in the day now. We have had it once in the evening, which was successful, but it's harder to get the trucks there at night because especially on a Friday night when people have worked all week, it's hard to ask somebody to stay, you know, till 7 o'clock on a Friday night with their truck in a parking lot at a, at a school in Midway, Kentucky. So having it at 2 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon generates lots of a big, big crowd, and that is easier to get the folks to come and bring the trucks. So give that a try if you haven't done that yet. Hey, thank you so much for all the extra insights and details about your plans for the upcoming year. I do want to read off one comment that was in the chat box. There was a, this is a reference to the traveling book collection if you're looking to um, add some free low-cost materials to your collection, your outreach. Half Price Book Outlet, which is located in Bowling Green, will donate books to nonprofits. Simply provide your tax ID number. So thank you for that detail. That is great to know. All right. Well, we will go ahead and transition into the wrap-up portion of today's webinar. Myself and Bookie will stay on the line for a few minutes after the end of the recording. But we just want to let you know of a few other resources available to you. A reminder, we have one more summer reading webinar coming up tomorrow with our colleagues from Henry County Public Library, Rethinking the Summer Reading Program, Our Journey from Ordinary to Outstanding. To find today's webinar recording, as well as lots of other resources, trainings, and materials about summer reading partnerships, please visit KDLA Summer Reading Support website. In the image, you will see the artwork for the CSLP program, A Universe of Stories. To learn more about the Collaborative Summer Library Program, Kentucky's role in it, and how that benefits your library, as well as upcoming annual collaborative themes, there is a link to the volunteer-run statewide coupon committee, as well as a how-to webinar. Information about our partnership with the Kentucky Department of Education as well as the Kentucky Summer Feeding Coalition called Kentucky Kids Eat that Bookie mentioned prominently in her training. You also find information about the KHAA Scholarship Program and many more resources. If you have a resource or best practice that you would like to highlight, please feel free to send those to me at krista.king-oaks at ky.gov or kdla dot youth at gmail dot com. Krista? Yes. May I give a may I give a plug for the Henry County Summer Reading Presentation? Yes, please do. If you all are able to do that tomorrow, I would
strongly encourage you to. I got to hear Suzanne and Tess speak at the um, conference we had, gosh, was that in November, Krista, at EKU? Yes, the end of October. And it was amazing. They had fabulous ideas, and I have pages and pages of notes from the things that they came up with. So you will get tons more great ideas from them, too. It's well worth your time. Thank you so much for the extra plug. You can find more resources from the Youth Services Retreat and Summer Reading Conference also available on our Summer Reading Support website. Just a reminder, oh, <laughs> a little too fast there. Just a reminder to find out about upcoming webinars, trainings, and more. Please make sure you are signed up to receive messages and emails from the Kayak Lister. To join, simply send an email to my address with your name and library. Every Friday, we send out a weekly digest of trending news and stories from libraries across the world, from the American Library Association, tips on programming to literature, as well as highlighting grants and training opportunities. There are more resources on the General Youth Services website at kdla.org. You can find statewide training announcements, asynchronous online training for our Early Literacy and School Readiness Program, information about our book kits, thematic programs, the Performer Showcase, as well as the archive of the weekly Kayak Listserv Digest. We want to thank LSTA and the Institute for Museum of Library Services again for their funding and support of today's webinar. If you have a few moments, please go ahead and click on the link at the bottom of your screen where it says IMLS survey. It should only take a couple of seconds to complete, and that really helps us to maintain our federal funding to continue to bring you more quality resources and training. A reminder that this webinar has been recorded and will be made available within one week along with your certificate of attendance. The slides from today's webinar are available if you click on the file download pod at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. I want to thank everybody for going above and beyond to make it to today's webinar, as well as our wonderful, phenomenal presenter, Bookie Wilson, with the Woodford County Public Library. Thank you again, and have a great day. This is the end Thanks, of the report. Krista.